God cannot lie. He promised to save his people. He never changed his mind. Today he still calls them my people. My people. My people. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. I want to welcome you in, on behalf of Mark and Alice and myself in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We are here to draw closer to him, him who is the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, yes. that we might have a clearer understanding of the things that are pleasing to God our Father, so we'll have a clearer understanding of what we should look for as we're looking to be led by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, this is, we're coming to a, a conclusion of this study, which has been going on now for oh, just over half a year. Uh, and this is our 29th part as we're at the end of the letter to the church at Laodicea in the book of Revelation in the third chapter. So that's what we'll pick up. We left off last week in Revelation 3.20. We're sure, I, I know, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's where we left off last week. That's right. So that's where we're going to start again today. But before we do, I'm going to ask Mark once again to ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Okay, this one, this is going to be a little different. There's a Bible verse, John 20, verse 31, that says, But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus Christ, is the Christ, the Son of God, and that be believing you may have life in his name. That's, that's a, a good goal. That's a good prayer. That's and answer. Lord, I ask you that we may see that more clearly. Amen. 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 Yes, Lord, open the eyes of our, our hearts. We see wonderful yes. things in your word. All right, as I said, we're going to, we're going to pick up where we left off, mm -hmm. and I'm going to ask Alice to start us off by reading all of uh, Revelation 3.20. Okay. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. All right. Uh, as I said, we last, in our last session, which is available here on the Bible Talk website, we talked at length about, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yes. So we'll pick it up now with Jesus saying, If anyone hears my voice. Yes. Now I find it really, really interesting that in all of the letters, all seven letters, all the letters to the seven churches, including this one, mm -hmm. the letters close with God's admonition that he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yes. Right? Yes. Remember, in every one of the letters so far, mm -hmm. and you'll see that's in this letter too. But interestingly, what's unique here in this church of Laodicea, which if you haven't been with us, you may not know how to, to the extent that we've shown that this is not even, it's an, maybe an assembly of people, um, but it is displeasing to Jesus to the extent that he's saying, uh, because of your lukewarmness, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. To this assembly, he says, if anyone hears my voice. Yes. Okay? Yes. I, I don't know that I've ever really paid attention to, to this before. But think that it, you see, the entire book of Revelation is given by God to be shown to his bond servants. Yes. That's what it says in the opening verse of the book of Revelation, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, right? So all of these letters are messages to the true church from the Lord. It's the Spirit speaking to the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. So today, we are to hear what the Holy Spirit was saying to the people in this Laodicean assembly. Mm -hmm. Right? We're, we're supposed to hear what he's saying. Yes. But they are instructed to listen to Jesus. Yes, Is there a difference? Mm -hmm. yeah. Because they did not have the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. Okay? Mm -hmm. If they did not have Jesus, and remember, he's standing outside, right? He's not in this assembly. Right. Then they did not have the Holy Spirit. And if they didn't have Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they did not have the Father. It's, it's as though he's giving them an invitation. To it, be it is. And that's what we're going, well, it, it, 
Well, I'm not going to say to be safe. Well, you're just getting a little ahead of me, right? Jesus, it says, he said, John 14, 6 is the only way to the Father, right? So without Jesus, if Jesus is not there, is not part of their lives, part of their congregation, part of their assembly, then they can't have the Father. They can't have a relationship with the Father. Exactly, right? Remember, the foremost commandment, Jesus said it was the foremost, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, should I say this in Hebrew? Shema Yisrael, Aranoi Elohim, Aranoi Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You cannot have one without the others. Right. You can't pick and choose what parts of God you want. Yes, right? Three in one. Well, God is three in one. Mm -hmm. And it is for you and me, it's three or none. That's right. Okay. <laughs> You, can, you can't right. you can't have the Father without Jesus Christ. He's the only way to the Father, and you're not going to have Jesus Christ without the, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, right? So, without having heard Jesus, this group of people is incapable of hearing the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, the, they have to backtrack. They have to exactly. Yeah. That's why I'm saying in all seven letters, it's saying to the readers, which is us. Mm -hmm. To the bond servants of Jesus Christ, who this is intended for, it's saying, if you have an ear, hear what the Spirit is saying, right? But here, this one unique situation, Jesus is saying to these people, hear what I say to you. Yes. Right? It's got to start with hearing Jesus Christ. If anyone hears my voice. There's only one intercessor between God and man. It's a, Paul wrote to Timothy, and it, 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 that's, the, that's Christ Jesus. Right? With, without Jesus or the Holy Spirit, they're completely devoid of the truth. Mm -hmm. In that same verse, John 14, 6, where Jesus says that he is the way, and no man comes to the Father but through me, he also, did I say the way, right? The way. He also mm -hmm. says, I am the truth. Yes. No Jesus, no truth. Right. It, now, you're incomplete. Well, I, I want to I say, and I pray that if you're here, listening to us, participating in this, you understand that I believe, and I know that I can speak for Alice and Mark in this, mm -hmm. that God's word is holy and true. Yes. It is there to guide everything in our lives. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. It says in Psalm 23 that he leads us in paths of righteousness. Mm -hmm. He leads us with his word, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus said in John chapter, uh, John chapter 8 that if you abide in his word, then you're truly his disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. No word, no truth. Right. Now, you can, have, you can have some what appears to be truth, but an incomplete truth can be an entire lie. That's right. All right? Mm-hmm. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy and said, make sure. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm just telling you a part of the verse. He says, rightly divide the word of truth. Right. You can wrongly divide it. And a half a truth can be a whole lie. That's right. All right? So they can't have, if they don't have Jesus, they don't have the Holy Spirit, they don't have the truth. Because the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, was sent to lead us into all truth. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, this is all so logical. Yes. Right? So the situation of these people here in this assembly called the church at Laodicea is far more dire than visible at first glance. There is no connection to God. No connection, that's right. Now, that's I am right. not saying that there never was. Okay. And that's one of the kind of the unknown factors in here, because we talked about this at some length, either last week or the week before. The fact that in John chapter 6, it talks about how some of his disciples, because his word was too difficult for them, some of Jesus' disciples walked away and left him. Yes. It is possible to have that, that relationship with Jesus and then walk away. And continue to be religious. But you can't have the truth. But you can't have the truth. You cannot have the truth. So this, and, and by the way, the church is supposed to be the depository of the truth here yes. on earth. You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus takes his disciples in the beginning of his earthly ministry 
you know, and he's, he's chosen these people um, and he's training them in righteousness. Mm-hmm. You know, again, I go back sermon to on the Mount. I'll, I'll go. Yes. In the Sermon on the Mount. I go back to what Paul said in, uh, in his second letter to Timothy. He said, all scripture is God breathed and profitable. And he says it's for training in righteousness. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesus was giving his disciples as he is giving us now his word to train us in righteousness. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. And he said in that Sermon on the Mount, you are the salt of the earth. Mm-hmm. You are the light of the world. By the way, that, that study in the Sermon on the Mount is also here and on the Bible Talk website mm-hmm. and worthy of your attention, right? The point is that the church is supposed to be that salt, the preservative. The, the church is supposed to bring the light of God into the world, right? Absolutely. This This... Assembly, this group of people in Laodicea, who say they are rich and have need of nothing, they, you know what they need? They need the truth, mm-hmm. and the truth is standing outside at the door knocking. All right. We know that Jesus is knocking, but the clear indication here is that he's also saying something. Mm-hmm. All right. He says he's knocking at the door, but he says, "If you hear my voice." Yes. So that, by the way, that door has to be closed. You don't knock at open doors, right? I mean, it's, what was Jesus saying? I'm going to read you what he's saying. Because it was in the beginning of this letter. He said, Mm -hmm. in verse 18 and 19, Mm -hmm. he said to these people inside, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. An eye salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Mm. Okay? That's what he's saying. He says, I advise you. The King James says, uh, uh, I counsel you. Right. All right? Mm-hmm. Now, I've talked about, gosh, I, I go around here. I don't like the word mentor. Right. In, at least in the context the church is. Within the church, yeah. the, how the church uses it today. It's it a had, worldly connotation. Well, it has replaced the word disciple, disciple. right? right? Mm-hmm. Instead of saying, you know, somebody is being discipled, now you say they're being mentored. mentored. Well, the difference is... Big difference. Optional. Well, it is optional. Mentor, by the way, who is a, a, actually person. A, a person in Greek mythology, all right? He was an advisor, mm-hmm. Okay. If you have an advisor, they can tell you based on, you know, their opinions, their expertise, whatever, mm-hmm. what they think you should do. And then it's up to you to, to, make to, to make that decision. A disciple has a master. Yes. When Jesus says something to us, it's a commandment. Mm-hmm. And he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Right. His word, all of his word from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is command to us. And the difference between those two is the authority. Well, it is. And the reason is because we as believers have accepted him as the Lord of our lives. We made that choice yes. somewhere in our lives and accepted. We opened that, that door. door to him mm-hmm. and invited him into our lives. Yes. All right. Yes. So God is a God of free will. Now, I, I don't want to get into the deal between uh, Arminianism and Calvinism, but I, I, I know for a fact by the way, I can make a good argument for either one of those, <laughs> without doubt, all right? That would be another Bible study. <laughs> yeah. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Yes. God is a God of free will. Mm-hmm. All through Scripture... To those who don't have that right relationship with him, he says, this is your choice. Joshua, out in the wilderness, with people that are supposed to be his, but are not living or acting that way, mm-hmm. Joshua says, listen, if God is God, serve him. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Elijah goes up with, a, again, a rebellious people of God on Mount Carmel and says, you know, how long will you be divided between the two opinions? If God is God... Serve him. And Baal, if you want to choose Baal, go do it. But make up your mind. It's the same way here at Laodicea. He says, because you're neither hot nor cold. They haven't made a decision right. between this and that. They want to stay in the middle. And Jesus says, that's lukewarm. 
And because you're lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Okay? Right. Hmm. So That's there a is a choice, right you know, for these people in Laodicea. That's true. While there is yet time. You see, you know, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, there's an appointed time for everything. All right? Mm -hmm. In Hebrews 3.15, it says, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me. Speaking of those rebellious people in the wilderness. Right. There's a time limit. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, if, if you're listening to this and you know that you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ, God is inviting you. He's knocking at your door. He is speaking in his gentle, sweet voice to you. But know that there's a time limit. Today, if you hear his voice. So Laodicea is the church of the last days. Yes. I don't think there's any doubt. And if, there, if there's any doubt in your mind, go back and watch all of the Bible studies on this, right? It's a church of the last days, and it is surely the embodiment of, the fulfillment of the Apostle Paul's prophetic words to Timothy when Paul wrote, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, right? Turn aside to myths like the... Like fables, yeah. yeah. I know, but I mean, but like mentor. <laughs> the Greek. Well, yeah. So they, like we all, have to choose what they will listen to. And as always, the choice is simply between sound doctrine, God's word, or the world's myths promising them their own desires. Mm. Don't lose sight of that. I mean, that's what... That's what Paul wrote to Timothy, speaking of the last days. Mm -hmm. So it certainly applies to the last days church, Laodicea. Yeah. He says they turned away from that sound doctrine. They turned away from the word of God. Remember, the word of God is standing outside. That's right. And they have accumulated for themselves teachers who will teach in accordance to their own desires. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. There are a lot of buildings today where people meet on Sundays, and they are not hearing the true, rightly divided Word of God, they are hearing ear-tickling messages that speak to them of their own desires. It's either going to be about God's desires or man's desires. All right? Every time that we turn on a radio or a television, whatever we do, all right, we choose to hear what we desire. Yes. Okay? I mean, yeah. as a rule, I'm not, I'm not picking on any style or anything. I'm not going to turn on a radio and turn on rap or hip hop. That's just not, that's not my design, okay? Um, if I turn on the telly, you know, I, you, you turn on what you want to see, what you desire, right? Mm -hmm. Now, Paul wrote and said, examine ourselves. We, we should examine ourselves. So the question becomes... And I, I can ask this of you, but I'm saying this for all of us individually. What do you desire? Yes. Okay? What do, you, what do you desire? Because what you desire is going to drive what you choose. Okay? I just want to read you a couple of verses to give you an idea of what some people in the Bible have expressed regarding this. Desire. Yeah. In Psalm 20, 73, verse 25, it says, Whom have I in heaven but you? Speaking of God, and besides you, I desire nothing on earth. How about in Psalm 42? As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You know what they desire, right? Amen. Does that put you in mind of the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In Isaiah, he said, At night my soul longs for you. Indeed, my spirit within me seeks you diligently. Does your soul long for God? Is he the only thing you desire on earth? 
It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart in the Psalms. You know what? I've, I've always said this. I've been saying this for almost 40 years. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he becomes the desire of your heart. Yes, he does. How much should you desire God? Well, I want to give you one man's answer from Scripture. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. That's Paul in his letter to the Philippians, all right? How much should you desire? You should desire him above all else to the, can I say to the exclusion of all else? Well, I don't know, I don't know many people, including my own very self, who have reached that point. I think it's something that you, as you go on, these things that you, you, you get so connected to, they just kind of fall away. The well, they more do. you look at him and focus on him. They lose their attractiveness. Yes, yeah. I mean, I have to say, well, I, well, I will honestly say, you know, I, it's like Paul said, he hadn't reached perfection yet. Mm. But you want to know something? It's not only the goal, but you know that it is the, the, the fate accompli mm. when you walk in faith. Yeah. But I can promise you that I have seen in my life things just fade. Yeah. yeah. There's a beautiful, beautiful song, an old song, actually. Um, Turn your yes. eyes upon yes. Jesus. Look full in his wonderful, wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. When you fix your eyes on Jesus, He becomes the desire of your heart. And the other things just kind of fade. It's not like I had to make a conscious decision, I don't want this, I mean, it's just, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold any desire to me. And you know, there are a lot of things in my life that I used to have strong, strong, strong attack or attraction to. Mm. That's true. Yeah. They no, hold, no longer hold that attraction. And since they no longer hold that attraction, they no longer have a hold over me. Now, You're not a slave to those no, things. Yeah. Because you either serve God or you serve mammon. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, not mammon, but manna. manna. If you remember manna in the wilderness, all right? Yes. This is a miraculous thing. God is feeding his people miraculously, and manna is coming out of the sky. And the people could go out every day and gather as much as they wanted, as much as they needed, mm -hmm. and feast on it, mm -hmm. right? The only thing they couldn't do was store it up. Couldn't save it. No. And in a way, that's, that is a good picture of faith. Right. Now, you can't store up faith. You, faith has to be renewed every day, okay? Yes. You can't live on yesterday's faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You need to hear from God every day. Now, I thank God for the testimonies of yesterday. I'm, I'm writing a book right now, which probably will be called Sweet Wine in the Morning. And it's a little book of testimonies from, from the last four decades almost of my life, where we've seen the hand of God doing mighty things. That's nice. Because they are an encouragement to live by faith today. You can't rest on your laurels. Now you can be encouraged by them. Yes. Yeah. But you gotta you have to hear from him today. So I've got to ask myself, am I living on what I've heard from the God today? Or am I living on memories? Okay? Let a man examine himself. How hard is it to hear hear God? Well, I don't, you know, I, I, I've done a lot of counseling in my years serving as pastor, and, and people come and say, well, I want to know what the will of God is. Well, that's real easy if you, if you hear the Word of God. You know, the first thing you need to know, you want to know the will of God for your life? Give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Bada bing, bada boom. That's scripture, all right. right? How hard is it to hear His voice? I can't hear God. I, I, wanna, I want you to listen to these verses from Psalm 29. 
the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thunders. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The voice of the Lord hews out flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. That's from Psalm 29. In Joel, verse 316, like that 316, he said, the Lord roars from Zion. The Lord roars from Zion. God, this what's the name of this book? It's a book of Revelation. God's not hiding stuff. This is not a book of secrets. This is a book of Revelation. God is speaking to us. God has always desired to speak to man and have man respond. That's what he's doing at the door of the church at Laodicea. Can you hear him? That's the question. So anyhow, once you hear him, it says, and then you have to open the door. Jesus is standing at that door. Remember, this is God to whom nothing is impossible. Right? Yeah. He could have opened the door. But he did not huff and puff and blow yeah, the door down. No, he or he just not. didn't use the knob. He didn't kick it in. Nope. He didn't miraculously walk through it, the no. closed door, no. which he did when he first, after the resurrection, That's went right. to the disciples. Well, they had a closed door, walked right through. Right. right? He waited for an invitation. Mm. He's a gentleman. He is a God of grace. He is a God of choice. Yes, he won't right? force himself on anyone. No, no. I, I, I don't want to get sidetracked, which I tend to do so easily. However, having said that, <laughs> I do want to say, as I, as I mentioned, I can make a good argument for either, you know, free will or no free will, Arminianism or Calvinism. Mm -hmm. I believe that God always gives us free choice. But it says, whom he foreknew, he predestined. All right? So he knows the choices we're going to make. I want to tell you something. The Apostle Paul was a man who said, I don't have free will. That's right. He said, I am a man under compulsion. You know why? Because God knew that Paul would surrender his yes, will. Yes. So, you know, did you ever sing? Did you ever sing the song "I Surrender All"? Mm -hmm. If you did, did you ever think about what you're singing and the words that are coming out of your mouth? Because you're responsible for every careless word that comes out of your mouth. I heard somebody say one time, "Change one word, I surrender some." Some, mm -hmm. yeah. It do doesn't work. No, no, it doesn't. But you know, Not what he said. I think that. The, on average, if you hear, if we sing the song, and I've got to tell you something, I've walked in, I've been preaching in churches, and I, I ask that song to be sung, and I say, wait a minute, stop, before anybody utters that word, mm -hmm. if you don't mean it, don't sing it. Because you're, 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 you're held, held accountable, accountable for, what, for, every, for every careless word, every word that comes out of your mouth, right? Mm -hmm. But I think we typically think in terms of, I surrender all, I, okay, I'm willing to give up my house, I'm willing to give up my car, I'm willing to give up my bank, and no, are you willing to give up you? Self. 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 Are, are you willing to give up? You know, Jesus said, nobody can be my disciple unless he denies himself. He is calling us. This is not, okay, giving up yourself doesn't mean that you're a spiritual superhero. Mm -hmm. It means that you've done what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. That's all it means. So finally, coming into line with what the Lord is requiring of us. If you ask me today, do I have free will? I, on the one hand, I say, well, it's possible for me to choose, not not to choose to be obedient to God. Mm. But on the other hand, I say, no, it's absolutely impossible for me to choose to be disobedient to God. Yes. Yeah. And and I, I don't say that. that You have to understand, I'm not saying that boastfully. No. I'm saying that I have surrendered my will to God. And I pray that in any period, in any place, in a, at any time, that I don't live that that the Holy Spirit would conk me on the head, not be subtle, and let me know that I might instantly repent. I know when you first got saved, you said you'd always pray, hit me with the, up the side of the head with a two by four. It's, it's <laughs> the, the Lord. There, there's a Hebrew word where the word hear and obey is the same word. Shema. Shema. It is almost like the same contradiction. Well, it, because, yes. To hear and to hear is the same as obey in the, in the eyes of God. I mean, I, what Mark is saying is that the Hebrew word for hear and the Hebrew word for obey is exactly the same word. Yes. What is that word? Shema. Shema. Okay. As a matter of fact, when I 
quoted that verse from Deuteronomy yeah. 6. Shema Israel. Israel. Hear, it means to hear, hear, O Israel. Or obey, O well, Israel. Yes, because they, you should never hear without obey. That's right. Okay. At least hear God. Yes, because remember, obedience is better than sacrifice, it mm -hmm. says in the word. Okay? Okay. So, he's given us free will. Now you have the choice. I want to tell you something. I, there's a lot of things I probably don't remember vividly in my life going back almost 40 years. Mm. And I don't know in your own life if you can go back. You know, I'm at the place now. Uh, I'm at the place now where I may remember story. some things 40 years ago better than I remember what I said 10 minutes ago. But that's another story altogether. But I want to tell you something. On the day that I, that I encountered mm. Jesus Christ in a place where I recognized him as God Almighty, and surrendered my life to him. Mm -hmm. One thing I remember, I heard, this was at my kitchen table. Mm -hmm. This wasn't in a church, it wasn't on a big, wasn't under a gospel tent. Or, mm -hmm. It was sitting at my kitchen, kitchen table. table, having a cup of coffee one day, many years ago. And I had this encounter with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And at, during that conversation I had with him, and yes, I had a conversation with him, he said to me, you have had your life, now it's mine. Now, to me, that was the end of my free will. I have no desire for free will. Yes. I have no desire to do what I want. I desire to do what he wants. Amen. So I will choose to listen to the things that draw me to that. Not my desires, but his desires. Amen. Amen. Then he says, I will come in and dine with him. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, words are important. Jesus said, I will come into him. Not into them. Not into the building. Right? Mm -hmm. He's not looking to get into this church. No, he's coming it, into you. This is into personal him. and individual yes. to whosoever so. will. John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So whosoever will. So Jesus is not trying to get into the building. No. He has no desire to get into the building. That's a, that's a congregation of a people that makes him sick to his stomach. That's right. He's calling them to come out. He's calling somebody to come out so that he can enter into them. Yes. He, Jesus is trying to get into a person. Mm -hmm. Because that's where he desires to dwell. To dwell. Mm -hmm. He will not live in a house built by the hands of man. No. It says that in both the Old and New Testaments. That's right. But we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. He wants in. Yes. All right? Yes. So he's calling them out. Is he calling them out? Listen to what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. Yes. For what partnership have, have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship, light and darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Hmm. For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they hmm. shall be my people. Therefore... Come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. All right? Mm. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17. So what he's doing is calling them out to come yes. out. Now, a lot of people get saved, and they want to stay where they are. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You better be, all I can say to you is, because I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I want to say to you, be very prayerful if you think that's the case mm. in your life. Mm. All right? Think about these verses. Mm. He will dine with whosoever will respond to his gentle call to come out and be joined to him. Yes. Okay? Here in the United States and some other places I know, places that we travel and minister in, mm -hmm. we typically have no concept of the importance of dining together yes. in a relationship. That's true. None. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here in America, I mean, families don't eat together anymore. Which, by the way, is a satanic attack on the families, but that's another subject, too. 
But we just don't understand that. Some cultures still do. Yeah, I, was going to I mean, Alice that. and I have lived down in Central America. As a matter of fact, Mark lived down there with us. Mm-hmm. And throughout Latin America, even though this is in the process of changing for the worse, mm. they had a much more family-oriented situation. Yes. Um, it's true, certainly, in places where we go to Africa, where a meal has such carries such importance yes. in relationships. That's all right. right. Mm-hmm. I was a pastor of a church uh, in New York back in the late seventies, and it was predominantly uh, Italian. Yes. And to a great degree, it was old, old Italian. Italian. Yes. In other words, for, there were people first generation, second generation Italian. Mm-hmm. And the culture was very, very different than what I had been accustomed to. Mm-hmm. I grew up in New York City. My dad was in the hotel business, and I grew up in hotels. And meals were something that, well, my mother and father and I always ate together. They were kind of perfunctionary. You know, you eat, get, once your food's done, get up and go, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So at... This congregation that I pastored of these Italians, my first experiences with this were quite shocking. Mm -hmm. We'd sit down because we had one fellow in the the congregation who was very wealthy, had a big house, and we used to have a lot of meetings there. As a matter of fact, we wound up having Sunday services in his kitchen, Mm -hmm. large kitchen, every Sunday night, Mm -hmm. which turned out to be communion, right? Real communion. But I remember sitting down the first time and, and having a meal, and after three hours, I was getting suspicious that there was something different here. Yes. Yeah. Because it's not just, okay, eat and run. Mm-hmm. This is a gathering of people who are bound together in the love of God. And yes, you, you eat. Oh my goodness gracious, you can eat. eat. Yeah. There's a lot of talking. A lot of, some of the best talking Absolutely. ever. People have said to me over the years, because, you know, we're still in contact with people from that that Mm -hmm. congregation here, 30 some odd years, 35, almost 40 years later. And they said it was those Sunday evenings Mm -hmm. that affected their lives so powerfully. We'd have services in the morning, which were really, really good. But then we'd come together in the evening and we would have this meal together, which was our communion service. But then we'd sit and people would just be so free. And there was such a relationship. Mm. They'd ask questions about about the scriptures. They'd ask questions about the sermons. They'd ask questions. And, you know, it was just such a wonderful, wonderful thing. Something that I had truly never really experienced before in my life. Absolutely. And I came to understand the value of that. Mm. It was such a bonding experience, all right? We don't have that in America anymore. No. You know, mom's off to uh, do this, and the kids are off to McDonald's, and dad's doing... It's like everybody scatters and goes their own way. We don't have a, it's been too long, and we really don't have an idea of what we have lost mm-hmm. in our culture. You know, last week we talked about that transition yes. from the church of Philadelphia to the church of Laodicea, mm-hmm. from what is the church that God has nothing bad to say about to the church that God has nothing good to say about. Mm-hmm. And we talked about how, you know, particularly in my generation, mm-hmm. I have seen this transition of the breakdown of the family in ways that would have been unbelievable to me when I was a young man, right? Communion. Mm. The Last Supper is a communion. Yes. Okay? That's what we base. That's what we base communion on. That was a Passover meal. Mm -hmm. And the Passover meal is a family affair. It was where a father would come together with his family and he would lay out the scriptures and and to to his family, to his wife and children. It was, you know, such a wonderful thing. It was uh, something that the church has traded in. Mm. We got, now we got Easter eggs and bunnies instead of the Passover. But remember, Jesus spoke to them, his disciples in parable saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. Mm. Most of the church today has traded the Passover feast for those Easter eggs Mm -hmm. and bunnies. Mm -hmm. The Passover meal is all about relationship. Remember the last one. I mean, the last supper. Mm -hmm. Okay? That meal, which was so important because a master comes together with his disciples Mm -hmm. as a father comes together with his family. And that's what Jesus was doing, right? 
And remember, he said to do this in remembrance of me, is what he said. And then Paul, in, in 1 Corinthians, says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the function of the church here on earth. That salt of the earth, that light of the world, is to bear witness to Jesus Christ. To bear witness of what? The cross. Hallelujah. The crucifixion. Mm -hmm. The Lord's death. Praise God for the resurrection. Hallelujah. I live because he lives. Yes. Hallelujah. But it is his death that opened the gates, that conquered death, that opened the, de the gates to life. Thank you, Lord. I can't, I don't know that it's possible to turn around. I can only say to you, if you're, you know, if you're family and you don't eat together, cry it out. Yeah. And you know what? Tell them, Turn off the cell phones, turn off the television, turn off your tablets, sit there, and it may be uncomfortable at first, but relate to one another. Yes. Yeah. That's where relationships are built, right? All right, let's go on to the next verse. Okay. Zipping along here. Revelation 3.21. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who overcomes. The ones who hear the voice of Jesus inside that church of Laodicea, the ones who hear his voice and choose well, will have to overcome inertia. Mm. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Inertia is, I'm going to read you something from the encyclopedia. Inertia is the resistance of any physical object to any change in its state of motion, mm -hmm. including changes to its speed and direction. It is the tendency of objects and people to keep moving in a straight line at a constant velocity. Something, well, you know what? Galileo, remember Galileo, the famed Galileo, determined mm -hmm. that the earth goes around the, mm -hmm. the sun for which he was put on trial by the Inquisition of the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, and imprisoned for the balance of his life after that. Okay, but that's another story. He made, he he had the common belief that it w or said that it should be the common belief that the tendency of objects to come to a resting position until a late, little later. That's like he thought that something that's moving. He he thought of inertia, but thought it would come to rest. Okay. Didn't understand that it takes it takes some kind of force to bring it to rest, right. like the brakes on your car. Exactly. Right. Okay. Friction. Friction. Right. But then Sir Isaac Newton, later on in that same century, the seventeenth century, mm -hmm. he published his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, the Principia. Okay, laws of motion. Mm -hmm. Now those laws of motion still guide much of science today, right? Yes. The first law of motion is an object that is at rest will stay at rest unless an external force acts upon it. Mm -hmm. An object that is in motion will not change its velocity unless an external force acts upon it. Okay. To put that more simply, and in a way that should be clear from our human experience, everything, including if not especially man, mm -hmm. resists change. That's true. Right? Newton didn't invent inertia. He was seemingly the first to observe understand and codify the fact that it takes an external force to institute change. Mm -hmm. With me? Repentance is change. Yes. And the Holy Spirit is the force. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. That's, it is Absolutely. right. It is right. Absolutely. Because without that force, nothing changes. That's right. So repentance is change. Yes. Right? From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17. That's how he started his public ministry. Mm -hmm. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, the Greek word that's used here, metanoio, is to change one's mind. It's yes. change. Mm -hmm. Overcoming is about repentance. It is about change. Paul wrote in, in Romans, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, Romans 12, 2. To the Corinthians, he wrote, 
Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Mm. The Lord is changing us. That's his ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose, right? Romans chapter 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. The potter and the clay. The potter and the clay. The book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, is about the completion of that promise. Mm. The ultimate change that the potter works. Yes. He brings us... I won't go through this. Maybe I'll just end on this and then make you wonder. <laughs> God took... Dust of the earth, he formed Adam yes. and breathed life into him. That's yes. how he created him. Mm -hmm. So man was formed. Yes. Man sinned. Mm -hmm. He was deformed. Mm -hmm. Religion started to tell him that he, he could fix that all by himself. He was misinformed. But then Jesus came in, hallelujah, and we were reformed. Hallelujah. But even after that, once you were saved, the word said you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind in order that you might be conformed back into the image. You started it in the image of God. Man started in the image of God. Right. His purpose is to bring us back to the image of God. So we went from being formed to deformed, to misinformed, to reformed, to transformed, to conformed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. Praise God. Well, think about it. Mm. Think about it. Did you miss any prefix in all that? No, by the way, I could uh, I actually preach a sermon one time yes. because God gave me this. I'm, I'll just close on this. We, we travel a lot. and I was traveling through the United Kingdom one year, just basically going from one small group to another small group doing these Bible studies. And I was praying because, you know, I'd, I'd see people one time. We never see them again. And, and not see them again. You know, we might have some way of being in touch with them, but... And I said, Lord, what should I teach? You know, I'm going to go in here and I can sit with somebody for a couple of hours. What should I teach? Mm -hmm. And the answer that I got from the Lord was very clear. The whole thing. Teach the whole thing. What part of the Bible should I teach? The whole thing. Okay. And, and the Lord gave me this. Yes. So I can go in now and in that, that, period, in that period of time, Bible. I can preach the entire Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Mm -hmm. From the time God was formed man to the time that he was be back conformed. From the time he was kicked, deformed and kicked out of the garden where the tree of life was, mm -hmm. back into Revelation 22, where, where he came. gets back to the tree of life. That's right. The whole thing. It's really, it's God's cool. plan is <laughs> really cool, cool and really simple when you see it. Yes. So if you'd like, write to me at office at BibleTalk.com and I'll send you a link to that teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> but in the meantime, I think this is where we'll, we'll cut it off this week. And I would say... Lord willing, yes. that we will end or finish up this study of the seven churches of the book of Revelation in our next session. Lord willing. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that you used to change us, that we might become more and more like you, more and more like your son, Christ Jesus, day by day that we would be that witness to your love, to your power, to your glory, to your grace, to your mercy. Thanks, Jesus. That we truly would be ambassadors for you, Lord God, bringing the knowledge of the presence of your Son, Christ Jesus, into every place. Lord, help us to be willing. Help us not to resist the hand of the potter, Father, as you change us, as you mold us and shape us. Help us, Lord, to just continually desire to hear your voice. Help us, Lord God, to grow those things of the world, let them grow dim in our lives, that you might be more and more visible in our lives and through our lives. We just praise you and thank you that we heard your voice when you called out to us and said, come to me, all of you who are weary. I praise you and thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. That was good.
Well, until that next time, I know, as always, yes. that my analyst wants to tell you, Jesus loves you. A lot. Hallelujah. So until next time, be used for the glory of His name. Thank be you. used to bring His love yes. to others. God bless you and goodbye.